Leadership. In this world of conflicted interests and polemic politics, we need it more than ever. But in a post-industrial networked age, we seem to want more bottom-up than top-down. The Arab Spring, the Tea Party, and Occupy Wall Street demonstrate the power of leaderless phenomenons. So how do we reconcile having less control with retaining inspiring command over an organization? And does a more collaborative approach give the community-oriented Pacific Northwest a competitive advantage on the global stage? As we'll learn from a visionary entrepreneur and an inspirational soccer coach, it's about designing a new model for motivation. I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Four Peaks. Welcome back. I'm with celebrated soccer coach Peter Fewing and Artifact Company founder Gavin Kelly. Peter, you've heard about Gavin's company and this pretty unorthodox leadership style. For you, as an expert on leadership, but more in the sporting world, what do you think about this? Oh, I like it. I want to work. I want to come in at 11 o'clock, and I want to come up with ideas. 11? Why not 9? Why not 8? <laughs> well, but I would be that guy who stays till midnight, and I'd be that guy who's walking Green Lake and on the phone, making sure that I was taking care of uh, whatever ideas came forward that needed to be implemented. So I like that. I think it's great. We had a player in 2002, uh, 2004, excuse me, and he scored 22 goals, Bobby McAllister, and he was a forward, and we have piano players, and we have piano movers. And Bobby was a piano player. And we used to, I used to mock him with the team. I'd say, Bob, remember that time where you had dirt on your hip and on your knee? Because you, you defended. Remember that one game where you defended two years ago? And the guys would all laugh. But everybody understood Bobby's job was to score goals, not to defend. So where does the discipline play into this? Because you expect that you want more discipline in a sporting situation. But here we're talking about something that's very loose and free. Does that work even in sports? Oh, yes, it does. I think it does as long as, you know, and I was being a bit facetious with Bobby. It was also a, you know, a, a bit of a twist because he knew he was required to defend as well. But I was emphasizing that his strength was scoring goals. But also, then when he did defend, we made a big deal about it. So we caught him doing something that wasn't expected and was a, a little bit out of his wheelhouse. And when he did that, then uh, it elevated everybody else. When Bobby was defending, everybody else did a better job. How do you handle the, the unexpected? Because you can't control this situation. I think you have to be prepared to, to accept it, uh, whatever it might be. Because uh, when you create that loose environment, uh, you're signing up. You're signing up for the, for the unpredictable. Uh, there are times when uh, we, we have things happen and we just had no idea. Uh, so that's about unintended co consequences. You know, we design for particular outcomes, which we hope that are gonna happen, but you can't always anticipate all the un unanticipated outcomes that are, are gonna strike you. Yeah, and leadership's fluid. I mean, there's, there's, there does come a point where you have to say, hold on a second, Gavin, that's not acceptable, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. You drank 15 beers uh, in the office, and you know, that, y your work was, no good, that's not acceptable. That's where leadership, you have to recognize situations and you have to say, okay, we want you to be creative, we want you to get your job done, here's where you've crossed the line, this is where it isn't gonna work, this is where you've got to improve, so that's where the leadership comes in. Yeah, I think that's a great point because uh, while it's very free and there's a great deal of trust, there has to be that loop of feedback and it has to be immediate. There. So if you give people a great deal of latitude and they're off, you know, they don't come in for three days and you haven't seen anything and you'll get started and get a little wound up, you have to pull that person aside and talk to them. You cannot let that go on because you have to hold them accountable. And it, without that feedback, you're just going to get wound up. Is there a specific way that you have to design the way you handle feedback in these situations or is it just, let me get back to you, let me get to you as soon as possible. As soon as it happens, I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, <laughs> I think you just have some principles in that it's going to be timely and it's going to be direct. Uh, we've had feedback uh, in terms of our communication style that we're sometimes pretty direct. You know, if someone comes to an interview at Artifact uh, and we don't offer them a job, we'll sit them down for 30 minutes at the end and we'll tell them why we didn't, we're not hiring them. So none of that Pacific Northwest passive aggressive no, or so used no. to. So, this, so it's not thanks, you were great when we send you home. We're going to sit you down and tell you why you're not a good fit. And nine times out of ten, this is a little bit of a shock for people uh, because 
that's not how you end an interview, right? Uh, and, but they nearly always respond very well. And, and so that's about that direct communication. And so it's, it's loose and, and, and free to a point. I, I think, think that's people from a team. It's yeah, the yeah, it's the same thing. It's a respect factor. I think that's a great way to recruit because the person you just let go is now going to go out and promote yep. for your team. Yep. Really? You know, yeah, they're going to say, you got to go work for this company. I didn't get the job, but this is what I learned. And so now, no bitter feelings, you think? Well, if you're honest with them, people can't argue yep. with you too much. When you cut a guy, if you cut a player and you're honest with them, if you're very, you know, Casey Keller. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the Sounders. He's just retired after 20 years. And he played in Spain, he played in Germany, played in England, the top leagues around the world. It finished his last three years here at home in the U.S. His favorite coach was Clive Charles at the University of Portland. And the reason he was so happy with Clive is because he treated number 18 the same as number one. Yeah. And he was honest with them. And, and I think if you're honest, you know, then then you can, you can pull a lot more from people. You know, you, you talked a second ago about how you communicate. So if someone doesn't show up for three days, and you're in an open space like you have in mm -hmm. your office, I would imagine that if you said, hey, can we chat for a minute? Everybody in that big room is going to be looking over to see if yeah. the body language of Gavin. My players knew that if I was poking a guy in the chest, it was a compliment. Because you cannot poke a guy in the chest and give them something negative. Because they can knock your teeth out. You're violating their space. Mm -hmm. But if the hand goes on the shoulder, Gavin, that's not like you. That's mm -hmm. not who we are. The next time, the guys would see the hand on the shoulder and say, Gavin's in trouble. Yeah. How does a leader learn to develop that courage because some yeah. pe most people just want to be liked but when you be that direct and that critical and offer that kind of feedback you're asking for trouble how do you sort of develop the thick skin that says you know what I got to do this it's, it's for the good of the team one of the things when I started a company was uh, that desire to when I started out to have that control and uh, be the boss what I didn't realize is that I was also signing up to that responsibility of firing people and that is one of the most difficult things that you can do as an, em as an employer. But once you understand that if you approach it honestly and, uh, and you're true, uh, it's okay. How was your first time firing someone? Firing someone? Uh, it was rough. And we went through the recession. I'll, I'll tell you, it's, uh, we, we were in a time when we're trying to grow the company. The recession hit and we acted quickly. And we had one of the worst days of my life, which was to let five people go all at once. And uh, we planned for it and we did it. There's no good way to do that, right? But we still were, were honest with them. We said that uh, the economy has turned. Uh, we are not going to uh, let this linger on and create this atmosphere of fear because that's the next thing that kicks in when you sort of, you let one person go and then you let another person go. We made the difficult choice to cut deep and, uh, and quickly. Uh, and it was, it was a very, very you know, trying time, but it was the right thing to do. You, you don't want to offend people, and that's part of the gig. But at the end of the day, you have to stay in business and we have to win yeah. games. And yeah. if you let bad behavior or if you make poor decisions, continue, then you go out of business or you don't win. Yep. And so sometimes, you know, it's a step back, uh, but it's also a greater step forward. When I talked about that 14-year-old team, you know, one of our young players pushed a guy, and that's not acceptable. And so I immediately pulled him out, and we had to sit him down, had to have a conversation. But now, two months later, he's a much different person. After, How do you learn that? I mean, because it's, it's yeah. a, a tough skill to, to really adopt. That's why I said earlier that I think I'm in my prime as a coach because I'm 49. Because at 23, 24, 25, mm -hmm. you're afraid to do it. And then it lingers and it gets worse and it festers. And then all of a sudden other players see that it's a problem. You know, we, we had a player in, before we won our first national championship, and maybe this is that 10 years that it takes, it's the coach as well. We had players that weren't being respectful and uh, to the coach and I, I would let it go and so then it permeated through the rest of the team but once I once I nipped it in the butt I benched a guy we were gonna go play the University of Portland the year before Arnie Clubroot road Scholar candidate academic All-American and first team All-American as an athlete you don't tell that guy now well you, here's what happened the year before he got beat three times in nine minutes for, th for three goals mm -hmm. and and so the next year I and he was going against a kid from the University of Portland who was very very fast and and so we put our fastest guy on him and tried to set him up so that he could understand how to defend well 
I, I ran over and said, hold on, here's what you got to do. And before I could finish, he threw the ball on the ground. And he said, I know, I know, I know. And it ended. And it took me, it takes me some time. I don't know how it is for you, Gavin, but I need a day to process. So the next day we're going to Portland and we get to the vans and I say, Arnie, you're not going. And, and that's where I learned about Plato's Republic. That's how bright a young man he was. He wrote me a two-page letter saying it's about time you stepped up and took control of your team. Wow. I was 35. Wow. I got home to a two-page letter about how the team should be, and that helped us. But sometimes it, courage, I think you mentioned, you have to have some courage when you're leading. Gavin, when you hear Peter talk about the time that it takes to develop those leadership skills, you know, and to, to, to victorious, 10 years, can that translate well in the business world where you have such pressures to make profits even if it's only your second priority? I, I think that's a that's a great question and I uh, there's there's something that you have to do as a as a new business which is plan for the longer haul and the third priority was to create a great place to work and these are all these these sometimes are interchangeable in terms of their hierarchy uh, but they're closely related and you have to understand that uh, unless you're treating people with consistency and unless you're, you're honest, uh, that's going to compromise that part of being a great place to work. When, when you start losing people, that just has such a, uh, a sort of exponential impact in a negative way on the company. And uh, if you do everything in, you, in your powers to keep people and to keep them engaged, uh, your part of those things already won. I said that priority may be a second priority, uh, sorry, profitability may be a second priority, but it will come if you do these other things well. Is winning the priority in soccer? It's a byproduct of doing the other things right. Yeah. So what are you focusing on primarily then? Well, getting the right people. Yeah. When we go and recruit, and I'm sure in your process mm -hmm. of recruiting, we spend a lot of time looking at players. I watch how they talk to their parents. I watch how they warm up. So the priority is getting the right guys there. The priority is creating good leaders so that when the guys come in, they know the expectations of the program. But then again, creating a culture. What is that culture? Unity. They, they, have to be, they have to be willing to sacrifice for each other. Does that come into play in the business world as well? This uh, unity, this sacrifice, this sense of shared purpose? What we do is uh, really intense. We have top, you know, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies, uh, the best in the world coming to us for the best product and the yeah. best work. Yeah. That creates almost a pressure cooker. And you have, you know, in the way that you have the pressure of a big game, we have the pressure of a big client and a big project. What's an example of a client that might have come to you to do something big? Uh, Amazon uh, is a big is a big client of ours, and uh, they've trusted us with some strategic projects. And uh, when these companies, a lot is on the line for them. Uh, that team that works on that uh, has to bond. Uh, there has to be trust there again between the team members, and then and when there's a weak link there, it's going to compromise that. How do you handle postmortems in athletics? Oftentimes after a game, if you've just been thumped, you don't want to spend a lot of time on it, to be honest with you, because you might say something that's, players don't forget what you say. I, I would imagine that uh, employees don't forget what leaders say to them, so a biting comment can last and take them down a wrong path. So, so sometimes you, you have, to, again, you have to read the situation. You know, we had a game with the kids at Pumas where the locker room before the game was a disaster, and it was too much joking around. I tried to quiet it down. So after the game, I'm standing on a bench and I'm looking and I, I keep saying the reason we lost today uh, and I came back to it three times. We didn't lose, we tied. I was waiting for one player to say, coach we died, we didn't, yeah, and I hammered him. As soon as I said that, I said, if you are satisfied with a tie, <laughs> then you don't belong in this locker room and I walked out and we didn't lose after that. How do you read the situation after a loss or something that didn't quite work out in the business situation? We allow some time to pass. Uh, and the postmortem is we take the entire team goes out to lunch or to dinner and we celebrate the good work because I think it's important to, to acknowledge when good work is done. Uh, you work for three months or four months on this thing. Take a moment to celebrate that victory as it yeah, were. Yeah. Uh, but also take it as a learning moment because what you're creating and you talk about the stories, uh, you're creating sort of this tribal knowledge. And so we try and capture the things uh, that we did well so we can do more of them, and we try and capture the things that didn't go well so we can stop doing them. So what was it in your respective lives that said, I want to be in charge, I want to I show the way here?
<laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, you, you lead. lead the way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I love people, and I, I love working with them. I get fired up to see development and improvement. I, I enjoy bringing teams together and having a purpose and a goal and a vision on where we should go. And so, uh, so for me, uh, it's really fun to be a part of something like that. And and I think leadership is learned, but it is also inherent. So, who inspired you at that time when you were thinking about leading? Who who would you want to follow? Well. Leaders that I really have a lot of respect for, Father Sullivan was president at Seattle U for 20 years. He did Bill and Melinda Gates' wedding. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a vision of greater good all the time and, and uh, what was best for the individual. The way he took care of me personally as his men's soccer coach was, was humbling and he was the president of the university for such a long time. Uh, I don't know Jim Senegal, but I admire how he takes care of his people and his vision and his, his non-negotiables for mm -hmm. his people. And then Rick Redman, you're talking about the... Um, the the victory uh, he's the president of selling construction he was a he's a, in the hall of fame mm -hmm. for college football uh he was a husky and he played in the nfl for nine years uh and rick as he was was the president of selling they had the victory room but they also celebrated the losses and hmm. so i learned by watching great leaders and um, those are some of the few that have really inspired me how about you gavin what led you to leadership who inspired you uh i'll say control but it wasn't... You it was, wanted to have control? You didn't want to be controlled no. by somebody else? I, wanted, I didn't want to control others. I wanted to control my own destiny. And I think uh, while a corporate life is a great learning ground uh, for, for many of the skills in business, uh, there's also, an, you have to acknowledge that there's, uh, you're ceding control to the organization, to your manager, to the hierarchy, to the meetings. And... Uh, that's something that I just didn't want to have. And uh, the amount of force and pressure you can exert on such a, uh, such a, in such a large organization is so small. Uh, so I wanted to be able to say, here's where I want to work. Here's the type of work I want to be doing. I want to be able to choose the people that I want to work with. Uh, all of those things were important because at the end of your professional career, you're going to re look back and you're going to remember not so much the projects and the the, uh, the games themselves. You're going to remember the players. That's right? it. You're, you're going to yeah. you're going to yeah. and we're going to remember the the people we worked with. And the players are going to remember you. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And and, yeah. and what you're saying earlier is understanding that uh, your voice. My partner Rob Gerling says that you have to imagine that you're walking around with a bullhorn, <laughs> even if you whisper that it sound, comes off like a bullhorn because uh, because of the position you hold. Uh, so you, you have to be aware of that uh, sort of that disproportional influence that you have. Yeah, that's great. And you can't abuse that privilege. I mean, it, it's a privilege to lead. Uh, Ed Taylor, uh, who's the, the dean of undergraduate students here at, at the University of Washington, he says that education is a moral endeavor. And I think coaching is a moral endeavor. We're, you as a leader, myself as a coach, we're the manufacturer of our players, our people's good old days. You know, they might not remember the success, but they'll remember the people and the celebrations and the excitement and the enthusiasm and the disappointments. There's great learning in success and there's great learning in failure as well. So you're both leaders here in the Pacific Northwest. There is a specific culture to this area, this, this sort of rugged individualism, uh, the gold rush, where people didn't really want to be controlled or led around. They wanted to manifest their own destiny, as mm -hmm. you say. Uh, are we all leaders here in this region? Uh, are we, do we all sort of aspire to become leaders, you think, from what you've seen in, in, your, in your positions? I, I think in some ways, yes. And people want to know they have a voice, but I think they still want leadership. They still want to know what's acceptable behavior, where are we going, what's the vision. There is a certain comportment that you have to have if you're going to inspire people. Yeah. So is that dishonest in this new world of authenticity? Well, I, I think sometimes, you know, I started that in 97 when we won the first championship. By 2004, and then this summer went in the next one, it did become natural. Sometimes you have to say, well, I want to be here. So you have to put yourself there, and then eventually you grow into that skin. As boss, you're not allowed to have a bad day. And that's basically what you're saying. And uh, I think that's somewhat true. I, I'm very conscious not to complain uh, at work, uh, not to complain about a client or an employee or any of those things because of the weight that those words carry. And, is that bullhorn you talked yeah, about? Yeah, and, and also to be aware of uh, uh, sort of the emotion that you bring and your attitude. I think it's in, in today's day and age, it's very easy to be cynical, and it's one of those toxic things that can creep into any organization is to step back and, and start to criticize rather than step up and start doing. 
And so I think as a leader, there is the game face you have to put on. Uh, no matter how, how bad things are, you, you have to be aware of, how, of your role within that organization. You grew up in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, you came to the United States on a basketball scholarship. You, you played basketball. Is there a difference in the culture of leadership uh, between where you came from and where you are now? There is, uh, and, and it's called the tall poppy syndrome. A poppy <laughs> is a large flowering plant. Uh, I'm not sure you're familiar with this term, but it's an attitude in Australia, which is the opposite of America. America celebrates its successful people and its heroes, uh, and they look up to them and admire them. It's the opposite in Australia. Oh. Anyone in Australia who is, uh, has any degree of success uh, goes out in the world and makes a name for themselves. Uh, if they get too uh, full of themselves, the, the Australian psyche is to cut them down and bring them down to size, so they'll turn. So they want to see you do well to a point. Is there something specific to leading in the Northwest that would be different from, say, if you were in the Midwest or in the South or something like that? Well, I've been told on, on the East Coast it's a much more um, uh, direct and in-your-face style of, of uh, coaching, and you have to be, you're a little more blunt and... Uh, uh, you keep a little bit, you, the walls are a little higher between player and coach. There's a definite separation here. Uh, there's a, it is acceptable to be connected to your players. So, Well, that's interesting because you both advocate this more collaborative approach to, to leading. And collaboration is not something in the Northeast, you know, New York, that whole hard, old world approach to business necessarily feels comfortable with. And yet, when we look at the Pacific Northwest and its, and its place in the competitive globalized stage, you know, can we compete if we're not being edgy and hard on everybody else? Can, does collaboration bring any benefits that competitive does not? Well, we've got three national championships. Let's say it does. It works. You know, you have to, but you have to know your people, don't you? I mean, if I think I would lead different if I was at a different university. I would have to, I went to an interview at Holy Cross and uh, had a great conversation with the athletic director. And, and he sort of said to me when I didn't get the position, he said, if you came here, you'd have to be a little harder, which I think as a leader, you have to recognize your situation. And I would be comfortable being a little bit, a little bit uh, harder, a little more distant. And then eventually, you do have to lead within your personality though. But you gotta lead the people in a way that will work. And the way you've done it here in the Pacific Northwest with your teams has worked, but might be quite specific to the culture here as well. I mean, you've opened office, you opened an office in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Will your leadership style be any different there than it is here? No, and I, I think that's an important thing. When we talk about culture, uh, I don't think you can create culture. I think you create conditions in which a culture will emerge. Mm -hmm. So th that's sort of the attitudes and policies that we have. They're the things we control. We don't really control the culture. It's sort of this amorphous thing. Uh, however, we would like to have San Francisco have a culture that uh, relates to, is a reflection of us. And, and so somehow a bit of the Northwest migrates south. Uh, and we plan to do that. The, the people who are down there now have all worked uh, here in Seattle and now they're moving down. And people who come into that San Francisco office will spend time in Seattle. So we think it's uh, their time in the company and in, in this place is really important. And we want to keep that connection, that sort of DNA has to transfer. So how's that Northwest vibe sitting with us Californians? Uh, so far, so good. Um, yeah, a bunch of hippies. <laughs> <laughs> if you look now at where you are now within your own organizations, with what you've succeeded in your lives, and then you look at leadership and the people who inspired you 20, 30 years ago, is it harder to be a leader today when people have more information, they feel like they, they could do things themselves, they don't need that old approach to doing things? I think you have to have a thicker skin with tweeting and you know all the access to information and you can say something. I mean, you you can be standing. I, I was interviewed by someone I had no idea was being interviewed. They had their phone right there and, I, and and all of a sudden I was a conversation and it was a reporter from a newspaper. So you have to have a little bit of a thicker skin and you have to be a little more cautious about your words because your words can get out everywhere. But uh, people are still people. They still have the same fundamental needs um, and they still, in my opinion, they still need that leadership. But uh, I do think you are a little more exposed and a little more vulnerable, and the patience of success is it's a shorter window. Shorter window. So did you miss the golden age of leadership, then? Could you wish that you'd had that where you had a little bit more control over things? No, and no, not, that had more not, time to actually get Not there? at all. And I think while I talk about control, it's control of me and my destiny, and I think a leader today has to relinquish control. Uh, 
uh, as a, as you, you're creating these conditions. And I think that's an important thing where there's so many, there's trends happening now in our society around access to information, communications, collaboration, social networks, all of these things are gonna change the way in which we think about business. And I think we as leaders have to respond to that. Clutching onto the, the old manual for, for leadership isn't gonna work. I think it's a good place to leave things today. Obviously, there's a fundamental shift in leadership, and it's clear to me that both of you are there at the forefront pushing that. So well done to both of you. So, you. Uh, Gavin Kelly and Peter Fewing, thanks for sharing your philosophy around leadership. We invite you all to extend your reach by connecting with us on Twitter with the hashtag 4 You can also follow me, HRH Media. I'm Hanson Hossein. See you next time for another episode of 4Peaks. Thank you.